The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would praise the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, Abdullah, by saying about him, Inna Abdullahi rajulun salih. Abdullah is a righteous person. In most cases, it is such that the religiosity of a parent is transmitted to their children because the first and most effective school of a child is that of his or her parents. Abdullah's righteousness was no doubt cultivated by his father Omar and many of the prophetic narrations which praise Omar were in fact narrated by his son Abdullah. The hadith wherein the Prophet ﷺ saw in his dream that he was drinking milk and that he gave the rest to Omar was narrated by Omar's son Abdullah. The hadith wherein the Prophet ﷺ saw in his dream that Omar was pulling out buckets of water from the pool with great strength was narrated by Omar's son Abdullah. The hadith wherein the Prophet ﷺ called upon Allah to guide the one whom he loved the most from Abu Jahl and Umar was narrated by Umar's son Abdullah. The hadith wherein Umar speaks of Allah's approval of his many opinions via the Quran was narrated by none other than his son Abdullah. Parents may spend many sleepless nights worrying about their children, be it for their education, their manners, their religiosity, their future. However, what we often fail to appreciate is that when a child sees his parent occupying such a status in the eyes of Allah and his messenger, coupled with the wisest of parental advice, it is only natural that the child will grow up to become a great individual more often than not. If you worry about your child's religious commitment later on in life, then know that the assurance of their faith is largely intertwined with yours. When Prophet Musa السلام, saw Al Khadr repairing a wall belonging to a stingy, miserly community who refused to host them, he asked him why he did that despite their inhospitality. The response of Al Khadr was the following He said, As for the wall which I repaired, it belonged to two orphan boys in the town, and there was beneath it a treasure belonging to them. And there father was a righteous man and your lord intended that they should attain their full age of strength and take out their treasure as a mercy from your lord so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved the treasure of these two orphans because of the righteousness of their father that's why ibn kathir he comments on this verse by saying he said this is evidence that a righteous person will be preserved with respect to his offspring and the blessings of his worship will benefit them in this world and the next. This is also why it is narrated that Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib would say to his son, Wallahi inni la atadhakkaruka fa'azidu fi salati min ajli salahi. I swear by Allah, I sometimes remember you, which then pushes me to pray extra prayers for the sake of your righteousness. Be the type of righteous person you wish for your children to become. Following the calamitous death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr carried the Ummah of Islam for two full years, three months and ten days. Just before the angel of death claimed his blessed soul, Abu Bakr summoned several of the companions, seeking their views as per the appointment of Umar. These companions praised Umar with words that he deserved, and as a result, Abu Bakr proceeded with what he had initially considered. He closed all doors of negotiation and selected Umar ibn al-Khattab as the next caliph, khalifa of the Muslims. There were some, nonetheless, who had reservations. They feared the harshness of Umar. During the life of the Messenger وسلم, his two closest advisors, Abu Bakr and Umar, had represented different but complementary advisory positions. Abu Bakr represented the wing of compassion and subtlety, whilst Umar represented the wing of decisiveness and force. The companions had observed and recognized this, and some were anxious at the prospect of Umar being in power. After Abu Bakr's blessed soul departed from its body, Umar ascended the pulpit to address the Muslims as their new leader and to address their concerns. He said, I have been informed that people are afraid of my harshness and severity, saying about me, he was severe during the very presence of the Messenger of Allah, and he was severe whilst Abu Bakr was the Caliph, then what will happen now that he is the Caliph himself? O oh people, I want you to know that this toughness and harshness of mine has been doubled. However, it shall only be applied on those who oppress and transgress against the Muslims. As for the people of peace and faith, I shall be softer to them than they are to one another. And any tyrant who tries to oppress any when I will put his face on the floor and put my foot over his face until he surrenders to the truth. However, after this, I too am willing to place my face on the floor for the people of goodness and chastity.
The conquest that subsequently took place during the time of Omar are beyond the scope of this recording. Such conquests include that of Al Qadisiyah, which altered the very geography of the earth, and a battle which can only be compared in its enormity and decisiveness to the Battle of Badr. The conquests also include those of Nahawand, Al Madain, Iraq, Egypt, Azerbaijan. They also include his restoration of Palestine to the Muslims, and the collapse of the greatest superpowers of Omar's time, the Byzantine and Persian empires, which fell to their feet and brought about a complete shift of power in the world. His 10 years and 6 months as Caliph of the Muslims can be described as being 10 years of utmost justice, prosperity and bliss, achieved through the implementation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine laws upon his land. Omar's final days were drawing nearer, and he knew with certainty that his death would not be by natural causes. There are several indicators that suggest that Omar knew of this prior to his passing. For example, number one, he was one of the two martyrs referred to by the Prophet ﷺ on Mount Uhud. Number two, Omar eagerly sought martyrdom through his dua to Allah. One such frequent dua of his was, Allahumma arzuqni shahadatan fi sabilika waj'al mawti fi baladi rasulika sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh Allah, I ask you to bless me with martyrdom in your path and cause my death to be in the city of your messenger i.e. in Medina and of course this seemed like a far-fetched request because the capital of the Muslim empire was al Medina. it was supposedly a safe haven for the caliph and the Muslims yet Omar would say Allah will bring it if he wills and number three Umar ibn Khattab once delivered a Friday sermon and after praising Allah and making mention of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr he said inni ra'aytu ru'ya ka'anna dikan naqarani naqrataini wa la ara thalika he said, I have seen a dream that a rooster pecked at me twice, and I believe this indicates the nearness of my death. For these three reasons and others, Omar was certain that his murder was both inevitable and fast approaching. His days would be put to an end at the hands of an evil and hate-filled individual who carried the nickname Abu Lu'lu'at al-Majusi, a fire worshipper from Persia.